Well, it's so great to worship with you online, and we're so glad you've chosen to join us for this service, to worship with us, and to open God's Word together. If you're traveling, perhaps tuning in, staying connected to us as a Chapel Street Church family, uh, we're glad you're doing that, uh, and we look forward to seeing you in person again when you rejoin us. Perhaps if you're a regular online worshiper from some other part of the country or around the world, we're glad you're with us. We say at Chapel Street Church, we want to be a place for where you are. So, wherever you are, we're glad you're tuning in to worship our God and to dig into His Word today. Let's pray. God, thank you for the way that you love us. Thank you for your word, which is living and active and speaks to us. Thank you for the chance that we have to gather together virtually and in person to lift our voices and to give you praise. And as we praise you, your spirit reminds us that you alone are worthy of all our praise, honor, and glory. Now, Lord, tune our minds and hearts to your word. Speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm sure that some of you, like me and like my wife and others, uh, you, you keep notes uh, that are meaningful to you. Maybe you keep an inbox of emails that are meaningful to you, but in the old days when people used to write actual notes and letters, we keep those things, a few of them anyway. I've got a little file in my office desk drawer of encouragement notes over the years that, some, that I keep because they're written by people that are meaningful to me. And, and I keep some at home as well from friends and family members. And do you ever go back and read those letters? Recently I was digging through an old drawer and I came across a letter that my dad's dad, my grandfather, who's he's with the Lord now, wrote to me when I had written him to ask him how he was doing in his car cardiac rehab, and this, I just want to read this little portion of it to you. The cardiac rehab program I'm in is going well, Jeffrey. I'm in a gym class with several men, and one, a good friend, died yesterday in the hospital from cardiac arrest. Just goes to show you, nothing is permanent, except maybe petrified wood. You'd have to know my grandfather to get that joke. And should be understood, a lot of people don't understand, and they weep and wail to the distress of themselves and others, but we trust in the Lord and Him alone. Well, Jeff, so much for my sermonizing. Love, Grandpa. <laughs> I read that, it took me back to just remembering the days I spent with him as a kid, and, and sometimes letters do that for us. Well, we're in a series of letters from the book of Revelation that are written to the church, churches in Asia Minor in the first century, and to the church, God's people, in the world today. There are seven letters to seven specific churches. As we've talked about, seven is the number for, it's a symbolic number of perfection and wholeness. So not only are these specific churches in history, there, it's, a, it's to God's church, the whole church throughout history in all parts of the world. Uh, and so it describes churches that are in existence today. Each of the letters has unique things to say to that church and to the church everywhere in the world. So our job as we read these letters from Jesus, and he tells us his word is living and active. It's not just memories. It's living and active speaking to us today. Our job when we read these letters is to be asking ourselves two questions. Where do we find ourselves in the experience of this church in the first century? And what does this letter to this church in the first century teach us about Jesus and his role in our lives as his people in the church today? So that's what we're going to be doing, digging through. We come now to the letter uh, to the church in Smyrna. I was recently asked in the, in the For Where You Are podcast by Joe Scovato, is it Smyrna or Smyrna? I don't actually know. We're going to call it Smyrna. Actually, the word, uh, the city comes from the word myrrh. So I believe it is Smyrna. Myrrh, uh, fr gold, frankincense, and myrrh was this spice, this uh, preservative that was uh, found in that region. So that's where they get the uh, idea, the, the root of the name. Anyway, it's a city in Asia Minor, Turkey. It's the first city in that entire region in AD 29 to build a temple to worship Caesar, uh, to Tiberius Caesar. Uh, famous for its devotion to Rome and emperor worship. Cicero called Smyrna one of the most faithful of Rome's allies in all of Asia Minor. So you've got this wealthy city, kind of a rival to Ephesus, the city from last week. And one of what they're known for, well, Ephesus was known for the temple worship of Artemis, Smyrna is known for temple worship of Caesar. Now, Caesar worship was institutionalized. The imperial cult was throughout the Roman Empire. But Smyrna was kind of uh, known for being serious about its devotion to Rome and to Rome's emperor. The imperial cult permeated the, virtually every aspect of civic life in the city, so much so that no individual could hope to get ahead economically or elevate themselves socially in terms of status unless they were fully engaged in worship of the emperor. Uh, so there was tremendous legal, social, and economic pressure on these first century Christians to do what everyone else was doing, which is worship the emperor, bow the knee, bend the knee, and offer sacrifices to Caesar. Now, there were no laws to protect the early Christians. There was no Bill of Rights. There, there were, they were extreme minorities in this city and in this region. You know, I think we tend to think that in order for the church to thrive in America today, we need to have our religious liberties protected. 
We need to have our candidate, whoever that might be, in office. We need to have prayer allowed in, uh, public prayer allowed in public schools. We need to be sure that the courts stay conservative or, or vote in favor of religious liberty. Now, just to be clear, I'm in favor of all of those things, and I pray for those things. But the early church had none of them. There were none of those things. In fact, just the opposite. I've been thinking about this question. Could I, could we worship Jesus in a society like that? Could we be faithful? Could we thrive as his followers in a culture like that? That's the culture in which we uh, encounter the, uh, the church of Smyrna. So let's read what Jesus has to say to the church in Smyrna and to us, Revelation 2, verses 8 through 11. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last, who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich, and the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Now there's so much in this passage that we're going to go through just to highlight a couple of things here. Jesus identifies himself as the first and the last who died and came to life. In each of the letters, Jesus gives a specific identity related to that church and their circumstances. So this is the identity of Jesus to all churches, but specifically to Smyrna and what they were facing. He says, I know, Jesus knows your tribulation and your poverty and the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. We'll talk about all these things in turn. Just a few verses, but it's packed with really important things for us as followers of Jesus. Smyrna is only one of two churches in all of Revelation, these seven churches, these letters, that Jesus doesn't have something harsh to say. There are seven churches, and five of them follow the pattern where Jesus affirms them and then condemns them or uh, says some words that are really harsh about what they're getting wrong. Only Smyrna and Philadelphia don't have any, uh, uh, Jesus has nothing bad to say about them. You know, it's interesting to me. Smyrna and Philadelphia were poor, persecuted, weak, marginalized churches, and Jesus has nothing bad to say. Laodicea and Sardis are wealthy, powerful, influential churches, and Jesus has almost nothing good to say. Now, that does not mean that a large, wealthy church is by definition bad, nor does it mean that a, a poor and a small church is by definition good. But I think it means at least this for us today. And we are at Chapel Street, a fairly large church, and God has blessed us, but we should be careful of evaluating churches and God's work in those churches solely based on the world's idea of what success looks like. Influence, wealth, power, size. A meeting a church a plant pastor years ago I, when I was in Russia, I, I met this church plant pastor who was, by, according to Pastor Victor, who trained him, the, the best pupil he'd ever had in seminary and in, in terms of his leadership. And he went to plant a church in a gypsy community at the foothills of the Ural Mountains in, in a far remote corner of, of southeastern Russia, southwestern Russia, excuse me. Very obscure, very out of the way, laboring in a place that was hostile to the gospel. He felt called there. I remember thinking, that young man is a hero in God's eyes. You'll never read about him. He, there aren't books written about him. He doesn't have a Twitter following. But he's a hero in God's eyes. Is he successful? Or years ago when I took a group of students to the jungles of Ecuador for the very first time, we still have gone, hopefully we'll go back again soon. Uh, we went to a, a very remote village in the far out of the corner in the Colombian border. There was a tiny little village called Totonaiki, which means the white water. A little church in that village and a little couple leading that church in a little tin-roofed hut in the middle of nowhere. I mean Discovery Channel nowhere. And they said they were so grateful that we came to bless them, to pray with them, and to reach it, do programs for their kids in that little village, maybe 30 people in the whole village. And they're laboring their whole lives in obscurity in the jungles for the sake of the gospel to build the church. Are they successful? 
I'm just saying, when we read about the churches, it's not just the large, wealthy churches that should, we should look to learn from. Sometimes it's the small, poor, and weak ones as well. And that's the case here with Smyrna. Now, notice again how Jesus is identified to the church in Smyrna. He says that he's the first and the last who died and who came to life. The first and the last, the one who died and came to life. He's repeating the very same thing that he said to John in chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am, there it is again, the first and the last, the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. This is such an important truth for those of us who follow Jesus today. Any follower of Christ facing any hardship, any suffering, any persecution, any trial needs to understand the depth of what this means. Let's talk about how, how, why this is possible. How? How is knowing that Jesus is the first and the last going to help you in your life face difficult situations? Uh, when Jesus says, I'm the first and the last, he's trying to help us. Really, I would put it this way. He's trying to help us overcome the disorienting effect of suffering. Because pain has a, a disoriented effect on our lives. It, it threatens us that we would lose perspective. It tempts us to mistrust God or to doubt his goodness. And so Jesus says, I'm the first and the last. Let's talk about those. The first. Simply put, nothing enters our lives that does not first pass through his sovereign hands. He's before all things. He's first. So nothing can come into your life or into history or into this world that Jesus is not aware of and doesn't first pass through his hands. That does not mean he causes everything to happen directly. But it means he knows, he sees, and ultimately speaking, he's in control of. And then the last. He is the last word. Jesus is the first word and the last word. And he is able to redeem and restore even the very worst things in our lives. So think about that. He's the first and he's the last. And everything in your life is between first and last. We live between those two promises and those two truths about who Jesus is. Nothing can come into your life that is not first passed through his sovereign hands. And nothing that has come into your life, no matter how painful or difficult or awful it is, is he not able ultimately to redeem, to heal, and to restore. If you doubt this, friends, look to the cross. It's the worst moment in human history. God died. The Son of God put to death unjustly on charges he was innocent of, tortured and executed. And that becomes our victory. That becomes the turning point of all history. If God can do that, then there's nothing in your life that hasn't passed through his hands that he can ultimately heal, restore, and redeem. I think we should cling to this, friends, that Jesus is the first and the last, and I live between those two realities. He's the one who holds everything. Now, what this means then is that suffering and sanctification are linked in God's sovereignty. Smyrna is a suffering church. They're going to be persecuted. They are persecuted. They're going to be increasingly persecuted. And what we're learning here is that their suffering and God's purpose of sanctification, that's a fancy Bible word for the process of spiritual growth, the process by which we become more and more like Jesus. Suffering and sanctification are linked in God's sovereignty. The Christians in Smyrna were experiencing intense pressure and persecution, and they're being told it's going to get worse. Think about that. They're, it's bad now, and they're told it's going to get worse before it gets better. What politician today could get elected if they, if they stood up and said, here's my promise. Things are going to get a lot worse before they get better. It's going to cost us all if we're going to get out of this mess that we're in, to get out of the debt, national debt that we're in, to get out of the situation socially we're in. It's going to get worse before it gets better. Nobody would elect him because we all want to hear it's going to be fine. I can fix it all. In four years, I'm going to change everything. And it never happens. Jesus says to these Christians, in your life, things are about to get worse. I'm the first and the last, but things are about to get worse. Now, specifically, he says in verse 9, your tribulation and your poverty. He says, I know your tribulation and your poverty. Let's talk about those two things because I think they're linked. Their tribulation is connected to their poverty for this reason. At the very least, part of the reason seems to be these Christians would not bend the knee to Caesar. They would not participate in the imperial cult, worship of Caesar. And they, therefore, they did not have access to the trade guilds that ran the city. I mean, think about it. Why would they be poor in the midst of a wealthy city? Was, were only poor people getting converted? Perhaps. 
Were they uh, just rejected and dismissed out of the economic circles? Probably. But probably some choices they made. They would not give in to idolatry, therefore they missed out on opportunities, economically speaking. Jesus says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, yet you are rich, he says. What does he mean there? In the way that matters most, you have what, need, what you need, what matters most, him, the first and the last. And then he says, so it, it quite literally cost them economically, financially, to follow Jesus. What, what does it cost you to follow Jesus today? What does it cost me? Really? I mean, to, be, to put yourself out there and say, I follow Christ, maybe, maybe some funny looks, some comments behind your back, some social media angst. What does it really cost you today to follow Jesus? That's not to say that it won't eventually cost us something, but for these first century Christians, who are our brothers and sisters down through the ages, it costs them dearly. I know your tribulation and your poverty. And then he says, I know the slander that you're experiencing. These Christians in Smyrna are not enjoying a good reputation in the city. I had a friend who once said to me recently, he said, you know, it used to be a decade ago or less that Christians were viewed really as maybe weird, maybe uh, out of touch, maybe believing silly things by the broader culture. But how quickly has it gone from that to being viewed as enemies, intolerant, bigoted, hateful for what we believe, being viewed as the problem in the world today? My friend said to me, you know, 25 years ago, it might have been a prerequisite to be on a, a member of a local church to get elected to a local school board. Today, that might be the thing that keeps you off that school board. That's how fast the culture has shifted and is shifting. So Jesus is saying this to these Christians in Smyrna. Now also, there was a wealthy and influential Jewish population in, in the city at the time. And here's why that matters, because there's this re reference about those who are Jews, say they're Jews, but they're not actually Jews. Those who are uh, of the synagogue of Satan, Jesus says. Well, what is he talking about there? If they say they're Jews, but they're not actually Jews, well then, who are the Jews? What's he talking about? Well, first, these wealthy Jewish, meaning their, bio, their, their, their genetic descendants of Abraham, their cultural Jews living in Rome, they enjoyed kind of an exception or an exemption, I should say, in the Roman world to, to imp the imperial cult. Here's how it worked. The, Rome didn't really care if you worshipped your own gods as long as you paid your taxes, kept the peace, and bent the knee to Caesar. The Jews were stubborn and uh, always causing trouble for Rome, so Rome gave them this exemption. They didn't have to offer sacrifices to Caesar. They could offer sacrifices to their god in honor of Caesar. It's a bit of a technicality, but it allowed the Jews to sort of hold on to their belief they worshipped one god and stay in the good graces in the in Roman world at the time. Early on, Christianity was viewed as a, 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 one of the many strange Jewish sects. But as it grew, it became viewed as an enemy of the Roman Empire and a strange and dangerous religion. And so, what's happening here is some of these first century Jews in Smyrna and in Asia Minor are saying, hey, those Christians are not with us. They don't worship the same God. They worship a, a, some guy who died on a Roman cross, and therefore they should not have the exemption we have, and they're not bending the knee to Caesar. So they're stirring up trouble against the Christians, which I think is what we see going on here. But what about this business of Jews, but they're not Jews? Well, the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 2 that not all who are Jews by birth are Abraham's descendants, but those who are Jews of the Spirit, meaning that those who have faith in Jesus as the true Messiah. So he's talking about those who are faithful to God and see Christ as Messiah versus those who are Jews by culture and heritage and yet are stirring up trouble for the true followers of Jesus. They're being slandered, in other words. This is no justification, by the way, for any kind of anti-Semitism. You know, historically, this passage has been used by some to be, to preach against Jews. And anti-Semitism has no place in the life of a Christian, none at all. Quite frankly, we have to remember that Jesus himself is writing this letter, and Jesus was a first century Jewish man. He's the son of God, yes, but he's a Jew. Three quarters of the New Testament, in fact, all but two books in the New Testament were written by Jews. So our history and our heritage as Jewish, we're only being pointed out here that even those who are culturally, quote unquote, of the people of God can spiritually be far off. The point is, God is going to use all of this tribulation, all of this persecution, all of this poverty, and all of this slander for His purposes in their lives. 1 Peter 1, verses 6 and 7. 
In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I want you to see this, for, this two words, so that. I think this is so important for us. Peter says, and we studied this just a few weeks ago in our series on 1 Peter, so that what you're experiencing if for a little while, these trials of various kinds, are so that. What's the so that in your life? What's the, what's the reason? We often wonder, God, what are you doing? And we're being told here, he has a purpose, ultimately, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, though it's refined by fire, fire being a symbol of the trial itself, whatever you're suffering, may produce something, may result in something, in you and in praise to God. You know, suffering, pain, difficulty, it usually has one of two results in our lives. It either leads to greater dependence on God or greater disillusionment with God. That's been my experience, both in my own life and as a pastor. Suffering can soften us, humble us, and make us more dependent and reliant on God. Or it can harden us, make us callous and more disillusioned with God. Suffering comes to us all, not in the same doses, not in the same way, not to the same degree. But nobody escapes. The question is, how do we respond to it? Does it make us more dependent on God? What's the so that? I think really what we're doing here in, in Revelation 2, verses 8 through 11, is learning to see the so that. Learning to see in our own lives and in our own experience, so that. What is God doing? I heard a story recently from a good friend who uh, supports a couple of mission workers in Cuba. They're Cuban nationals, and they're working for the gospel in Cuba. Now, if you've been following the news at all, you know things are not good in Cuba right now. Massive unrest, massive protests. People are literally starving, can't get the basic necessities. These two mission workers were saying they have to brush their teeth with bar soap because they haven't had toothpaste in over two years. And they recently were waiting in line to get bread for four hours, and then they ran out of bread before they could get to the front of the line. And they, were, they wrote a letter back saying, pray for us for bread, but we see God's purpose in it because we were able to share the gospel with people in line for four hours. They're sharing of the bread of life while waiting for physical bread. What a perspective. So that. You're suffering, no question. Jesus isn't whitewashing or glossing over or pretending that things don't hurt or that you don't experience pain. He's saying, keep in mind, I'm the first and I'm the last, and there's a so that in the middle because he's doing something. Anything you are depending on in your life other than God, God wants to deal with that. That's one of the so that's for all of us. Anything in my life that I'm depending on and relying on other than God, God wants to deal with that and remove it for my good and for his glory. And sometimes the only way that happens is through pain and through trial. In verse 9, Jesus says, I know your tribulation. I know. Jesus knows, friends. Jesus knows. Now, those two words, if you got your Bible, I would circle, underline uh, the word G I know. He knows. He knows and he sees all that's going on and all that's about to happen. And if I'm honest, here Jesus is, he's saying to these Christians who are struggling and suffering and in poverty and being slandered, he says it's going to get worse, you're going to be thrown into prison, and some of you are going to die. And he doesn't do anything to stop it. Does that bother you? If I'm honest, it bothers me a little bit. He says nothing to stop it. He could have. Sometimes in history he does. Why not here? Well, perhaps God has a bigger agenda than their present circumstances. He's the first and the last. We live in between. Perhaps he's up to things that we can't see. And maybe, I've been reflecting on this, maybe, maybe I'm asking the wrong question. Maybe the question isn't really, why are these Christians suffering and being persecuted? But the question is, why am I not? Why have I had such an easy life? Why don't I? What gives me the right to expect a life of ease and comfort and freedom from persecution? Uh, you know, recently I was reading about the persecuted church in the world today. It's not just first century stuff, friends. This is happening around the world all over. The persecuted church today, in just the last year, 
There have been 340 Christians living in places, 340 million Christians, excuse me, living in places where they experience high levels of persecution and discrimination. 340 million. 5,361 Christians killed for their faith in the last year. 4,488 churches, schools, or other Christian buildings attacked or destroyed. 6,200 believers detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, and imprisoned in the last year. Now, we don't experience that in our country. We seem insulated from that. It's far away, but it's happening all around us all the time. This is not just ancient th stuff that's going on. This is a letter to the church today. And we should be praying, praying on our knees for our brothers and sisters in the persecuted church. That's when Jesus says the tested genuineness of your faith. He's producing something. He's refining something. And he knows, I know your tribulation. I know what you're facing. Now, Jesus knows, saying Jesus knows, it doesn't solve everything. It doesn't magically make the pain go away. But I, I have found that those two words, Jesus knows, they make all the difference if you understand them. Don't, deep down, don't you, just want to, don't you just want to believe and trust that he knows, that he sees, that he's with you in the midst of it? Uh, one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament that points to this is a story out of Exodus. It's a story of, of God's people in slavery, in bondage, in Egypt. They're crying out to God. Does he know? Does he see? Does he care? And in Exodus 2, verses 24 to 25, I love this passage. And God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham. And God saw the people of Israel. And God knew. I love that. God heard. God remembered. God saw. And God knew. It doesn't say knew what. He just knew. He just knows. He knows. God hears. God sees. God remembers. And God knows. What you have faced and experienced what you are facing and what you will experience, what we will face as his people. He knows nothing is beyond his knowledge. So the, our response then is, do not fear the, what you're about to suffer. That's what Jesus says, do not fear. This is the same command he gives to John in verse 17 of chapter 1. When he falls down as though one dead, Jesus says, do not be afraid. I'm the first and the last. In fact, we said in that ser sermon a couple weeks ago, the only one we should fear is Jesus, and Jesus is the very one who says, do not fear. So, what are you afraid of? Really, what, what are you afraid of? If you're sitting with family members or friends right now, maybe turn to them and ask, and let them know, what are, you, what are you most, what's your biggest fear? Is it snakes? Is it spiders? Is it heights? What is it? Is it public speaking? What's your greatest fear? Whatever it is, Jesus knows, Jesus sees, Jesus hears. You know, I think for many of us, it's suffering. It's pain. Are you afraid of suffering? I mean, who wants to suffer? Who's excited about it? Who's hoping for it? Persecution. Sometimes the sting of suffering is the fear of suffering itself in our lives. The, the anxiety of what might happen, what's to come. Listen to what C.S. Lewis writes in his, his book, uh, The Screwtape Letters. There is nothing like suspense and anxiety for barricading a human's mind against the enemy. Enemy meaning God. He wants men to be concerned with what they do. Our business is to keep them thinking about what will happen to them. So this is a demon writing in fiction, a letter, a fictitious letter, saying that there's nothing like suspense and anxiety because it makes them worry about what's going to happen. God wants us focused on what must we do in this moment to trust him. Sometimes we're, we're fearful. I, I've, I've known people that, you know, I think it's possible that if you've experienced a lot more than your share, shall we say, of, of persecution or suffering or pain, that you can slip into thinking that maybe God is against you. Maybe God has it out for you. And on the other side, many of us who haven't really experienced very much persecution, suffering, or pain, we can start to think that, you know, somehow God's going to suddenly recognize his error on the ledger and go, wait a second, they haven't had their fair share. Stop the blessing machine. We have to make even things out here as if God's up there, you know, trying to make sure it all goes in, you get, and it all gets evened out and nobody gets off easy in this life. That's not how God operates. Jesus says, do not fear. Do not fear God. As if he's going to get you because you haven't suffered. And do not fear whatever comes into your life. In verse 10, he says, some of you are going to be thrown into prison. 
Now, in the ancient world, prison is not uh, the, the punishment that it is in our society. Prison sentences didn't exist that way. You know, you, you're convicted of a crime, you serve a prison sentence in, in our culture. That didn't happen in the ancient world. Prison was a place you were held as the accused or condemned until your punishment, which was usually, uh, at the very least, a massive fine, often beatings, torture, and execution or death. And Jesus says, that's what's going to happen to some of you. You're going to be imprisoned, and you're going to, some of you will die. And then he says, for 10 days. Did you catch that? 10 days. You'd think, well, it's only 10 days. What does the 10 days mean? Is it literal? Is it symbolic? Honestly, I don't know. And scholars debate this. I think probably it's a reference to this is a brief period of time in the scope of eternity. Your suffering and your persecution is not going to last forever. There's going to come an end. Although some of you will pay the ultimate price in this life for your faith. Some would die. Death, our greatest fear. What the Bible calls our last enemy. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 says the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And it's destroyed by Christ at the cross. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 through 15. Since therefore the children share in the flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who th through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. That last line, through fear of death, subject to lifelong slavery. Our fears enslave us. What we're afraid of holds us captive. Jesus says, fear not. I've conquered the last enemy. The, the last final great enemy, death, is taken away. So what else is there to fear? Nothing, he says. Even, and he's saying this to people who are slandered, who are poor, who are persecuted, who are about to face imprisonment and even death. Do not fear. I, I, honestly, I can preach this and I can read this, but I don't know that I live this way. This is so liberating. I want to. It's so like what the Apostle Paul says when he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You kill me? I'm with Jesus. You let me live, it's for his kingdom. I win either way. I am untouchable, is what he's saying. I want to live an untouchable life. Not free from pain. Nobody gets to live a life free from pain. But at a deeper level, at a more meaningful level, a life that's untouchable, because I have such security in Christ. Don't you want to live that way? Totally free? I'm not saying that I do, but I want to. And, and here's the good news. If that's what you want, that's what Jesus wants for you and for me as well. That's precisely what he wants, what he's saying to us. Then last, he says, be faithful. Specifically, he says, be faithful unto death. Be faithful unto death. And then he says, he's going to give the crown of life to those who are faithful unto death. Wait, huh? Those of you who are about to die, I'm going to give you the crown of life. Well, clearly he can't be talking about physical life on this earth because they're about to lose their life from persecution. You see, if, if this life is all that we get, if these 70, 80, 90 years, however long God gives us, if this is it, like my, my, my grandfather's note, right? Just goes to show nothing's permanent in this life, but we trust in the Lord. If it's all we get, then, then to die this way, it feels like God's love has failed somehow. God's promises aren't true. The worst thing that can happen to you or to me is not physical death. It's not physical pain. Do you know that? The worst thing that could happen to you is not physical death. It is to miss out on the crown of life that Jesus promises those who are faithful unto death. What, this is what N.T. Wright calls life after, life after death. That this life is fleeting. It's just a blip in eternity, but it's not all there is. Your life is not a, a point A to point B and it's over. It's a, it's a ray that extends from your earthly life into eternity. You have a life to come. The crown of life is promised to, to us. This is what James writes about in James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man or woman who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. There it is again, the crown of life, which God has promised. This phrase, steadfast under trial, is similar to what uh, Jesus means when he talks about those who conquer or overcome. He doesn't mean in our own strength, we just grit our teeth and get through it and we win. It means that we stay faithful to him because he has already conquered death at the cross. I think a good description of what it means to be faithful unto death is to be clear in the face of fear. 
There's a story in Acts chapter 4 where Peter and John, John, the writer of Revelation, are, are before the Sanhedrin, the same Jewish high council that put Jesus to death, or let strong arm Pilate into putting Jesus to death. And they have beaten them and interrogated them and warned them not to preach the gospel, not to preach in Jesus' name. And they say, we have to obey you, God rather than you, so you know, that's not, we, we don't have a choice here. And they leave, and they get together with the other Christians. Now, they've just been imprisoned, interrogated, and beaten for, their, for preaching the gospel. And they get together with other believers, and they pray. What would you pray for if you had just been arrested, interrogated, tortured for preaching in Jesus' name? You know, I might pray for a relaxation of the laws, maybe, a change of policies, a change of hearts of those in leadership. God, get those men out of leadership or change their hearts or more religious liberty. Those would be good things to pray for. Do you know it's not what they pray for? In Acts chapter 4, specifically in verse 29, they pray that they would be even more bold in proclaiming the gospel. <laughs> they don't pray for a change of circumstances. They don't ask God to ease their suffering. In fact, they rejoice that they're counted worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. What kind of faith is that? They pray that they could be clearer and more bold in whatever comes. Of course, they wouldn't, they wouldn't uh, reject it if the, if the leaders of the culture and the society and the Jewish leaders and Roman leaders r relaxed the laws and allowed them to preach freely. They would love that. But it's not what that's most important to them. Oh, I've got to be honest. Most often, what's most important to me is my own comfort, my own security, my own ease. Is that true for you? What we're being told here about these early Christians, perhaps the reason Jesus has nothing bad to say about them, is what they wanted most was not a change of circumstances, but to be faithful unto death. Whatever comes, to be found faithful. There's a paradox here. This poor, weak, suffering church is actually bold, clear, and, and strong, and a faithful and so should we be. There's a story of the man named Polycarp. Maybe you've heard of Polycarp. Polycarp's name means much fruit. Polycarp uh, lived to be 86 years old in the Roman Empire. He was bishop of Smyrna, uh, the church in Smyrna. L died in 160 AD, so roughly 100 years, maybe 90 to 100 years after the letter to, uh, to the church in Smyrna was written. He's the last martyr of the great persecution. 86 years old. He's arrested, put on trial, and threatened. He said, just bend the knee and renounce the Christ. And you know what Polycarp says? Famously, it's a great story. It's, it's long, but I'll just read this portion. Swear, urged the proconsul, reproach Christ, and I will set you free. Polycarp responds, 86 years have I served him, and he has never done me any wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? I have wild animals here, the proconsul said. I will throw you to them if you do not repent. Call them, Polycarp replied. It is unthinkable for me to repent from what is good and turn to what is evil. I will be glad, though, to be changed from evil to righteousness through my death. If you despise the animals, I'll have you burned, the proconsul threatened. You threaten me with the fire that burns for an hour and that is then extinguished. But you know nothing of the fire of the coming judgment and eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. Why are you waiting? Bring on whatever you will. My Savior awaits. Huh. The Bishop of Smyrna, he's, he's a spiritual descendant of these Christians in this letter we're reading in, in chapter 2. And so are we. It seems like an ancient story so far from us, but so are we. Whatever comes into our life. And I, I'm not trying to compare our sufferings and our trials, uh, as petty as they may be, with what happened to Polycarp or these first Christians. But whatever comes into our life, Jesus says, I know, I'm the first and the last, you live in between. I see, I know. Don't be afraid, but be faithful. Friends, let that be our prayer, that at the end of our life, whenever that comes, however that comes, we are found faithful. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your faithfulness to us. We confess that we are unfaithful people. We waver, we're fearful, we're anxious, we're worried about our own comfort and security, we're stressed about the future. Thank you for these words to the church in Smyrna, which are words to us as well. That you know all, you are the first and the last, you have conquered death, the last enemy. And so Jesus, teach us to rest in you, not to fear and to be faithful. We praise you, amen. But now, as we, sent, as we go away from here and get sent out, let me bless you with these words from Romans 8, 
38. For we can be sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Bless you, church. Have a great week.